But when Captain Cook came through this area in the 1780s, 1790s, Glacier Bay, which is just over this mountain range, was just full of ice clear at the mouth of the bay. It was reported that the ice at the mouth of the bay was 12 to 1800 feet thick. It was 12 to 1800 feet thick there. It was probably two, three, four thousand feet thick right over the mountain range here. At the peak of the last great ice age, there was so much water in the form of ice on land in North America, Northern Europe, Northern Asia, and Antarctica that the ocean level is as much as 268 feet lower than it is now. So global warming has been going on for a long time. At the peak of the last great ice age, there was so much ice here that these hills on this peninsula were rounded off by the glaciers, including Mount Riley that's over 1,700 feet high. So at one time there was over 1,700 feet of ice here. Well, <clears throat> the Earth's crust floats on the magma, the liquid portion of the center of the Earth, and so I've put millions and billions and trillions and quadrillions and quintillions, sextillions, septillions and octillions of tons of weight on the Earth's crust. It pushes the Earth's crust down into the magma. If you put weight on a ship, it goes down in the water, take the weight away, and the Earth's crust slowly floats higher on the magma. Well, this phenomenon is called isostatic glacial rebound. And uh, with the rise of the ocean level and with um, the Haynes area undergoing isostatic glacial rebound, it is rising out of the sea at the rate of about nine-tenths of an inch a year. That doesn't sound like a lot, but I bought this probably in 1965 or 66. So since then, it has risen out of the sea more than three feet and probably four feet. Well, people say that's hard to believe. How do you know that? We have some photographs that suggest it, and we have some survey evidence that pretty well confirms it. On a different subject, in 1970, I had a building built in downtown Haines, Alaska, and when we built that building, I found a bed of clams. These clams were long dead. They were when Haines was on the bottom of the ocean, and uh, they were uh, full of silt and sand, but uh, that's where they used to live. Well, <clears throat> if you'd been here in the 1920s, and the aerial photograph would have looked like this. I can find it here. And so uh, it was like this. And uh, the uh, town of Haines is here. Fort William A. Seward, the first army post in Alaska, is here. The cruise ship's dock here, and the golf course is right here. It looks wetter then than it does now, but it's hard to tell that too much from this photograph. Well, <clears throat> uh, and you ever watched the Discovery Channel program, Gold Rush Alaska? And if you did, you would know who John Snobble was. John Snobble's family brought him here in the 1930s, and then in World War II he was in the Navy, and after he got out of the Navy, he built a lumber mill out for the Spruce Ridge meets the river. At that time, the river was deep enough that there was a tug and a barge that would haul the lumber away. When I came here in 1963 and then to the 1970s, they still used a tug to tow log rafts in, but by then they were trekking the lumber to the deep water port over on the other side of the mountain here. And then by the 1970s, middle 1970s, they moved the lumber mill to Petersburg is under different ownership then, and but they had to go someplace where there's deep water so they could get the log rafts to come in. In 1946, John Schnabel also took a photograph from that point to the mountain that's across the road here. You can see part of the roadbed of the highway here because there's no brush or trees out here at all. In fact, you see a lot of standing water out here. Well, that's where the golf course is now. And so with isostatic glacial rebound, it has changed that much. By 1961, an aerial photograph looked like this. The highway is here, the town of Haines is over here, and the golf course is this area out here. 1961, no brush or trees out here at all. So then uh, by 1998, an aerial photograph looked like this. The highway is here, the airport's out here, and the golf course is in this area here. Very little brush or trees out here at all in 1998. Well, <clears throat> uh, in 1918 or 1919, this property was surveyed as a homestead. 
you know, surveyed to mean high, high water on a tide basis. And at that time, mean high, high water was from the little shed at the driving range by the ninth green where the trees have their lower limbs cut off and on out to the highway. So that was a line uh, from the highway here across the driving range here. Because I was the upland property owner, I was still entitled to land to mean high, high water. So in 1992, I had it resurveyed to mean high, high water. It took it from the driving range here out to the river by T's for number six, and from the highway here out to the river by T's for number seven. And from isostatic glacial rebound, the fancy name for this phenomenon, I gained 93.4 acres of accreted land, and that's where the golf course is now. We are actually in the upland property here, but the ninth green is here, the first is here, the second, and the uh, various other greens out there. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers considers all of this to be wetlands, and because it's all wetlands, it took seven and a half years to get the permits to build the golf course. We moved the first dirt July 22, 2003, started laying the turf on the greens in 2004, finished late in the season 2005, so 2006 was our first year as a golf course. Well, <clears throat> uh, all five kinds of Pacific salmon come up this big river. And of the five kinds of Pacific salmon, three kinds spend one to two years in freshwater lakes, streams, and ponds before they go out to the ocean to mature, they come home, they spawn, and they die. The Atlantic salmon will spawn multiple times, but the Pacific salmon only spawns once and dies. So, <clears throat> because of the sensitive nature of this area, we do not use herbicides or pesticides or toxic chemicals on the golf course. Uh, we do use some fertilizer. We have permission to do that, but we do not use toxic things. So, uh, to show you how prolific these little streams are that may only be a foot or two wide in a lot of areas, uh, and uh, two summers ago they removed the um, culvert and replace it in the stream that's uh, about a uh, road that's about a thousand feet over here. And in the s small area there, they captured over a thousand coho salmon that they then put in other areas. And uh, so <clears throat> it is a very productive area. Uh, the, uh, in addition to the sand, well, the river is cloudy now and it's cloudy because of the weight of the glaciers. And the glaciers grind the rock so fine that uh, it does not settle out very well. And if you were to take a jug of that home and not disturb it a year from now, it wouldn't be completely settled out because it's ground so fine. But in addition to this, well, as the water level drops down when the high level temperatures are cooling down, the water becomes clear and it stays clear all winter until uh, middle of May to the 1st of June when the water level comes up and it's high now because of the uh, melting of the glaciers and so in addition to the salmon that come up this river there's another small fish that's called a uacon. Most people say it's a hooligan, they say they go hooligan fishing but they uh, catch them for their oil, and uh, they're also called needlefish because they're long and skinny. They're about six or eight inches long. And then uh, they're also called candlefish because they uh, can be dried and they're so oily that they can be burned as a candle. So they're called candlefish. So then uh, when these fish come in, there are thousands of seagulls that come in, probably millions. and. Uh, it's late uh, April, early May when they come in, and so it's refrigerator temperatures at that time of year. So then uh, the seagulls and the eagles and the bears eat them, and a week later I couldn't find any of them. But it's refrigerator temperatures, so they never did get stinky. Um, so we have millions of wildflowers out here. And the first flowers that bloom in the spring are the marsh marigolds. And the marsh marigolds are in small streams and marshy areas. And uh, there are millions of them. And then the shooting stars bloom in the rough between the third and the fifth fairways a few years ago. The shooting stars were 
like that. And uh, so then the uh, chocolate lilies bloom, and the chocolate lilies are a true lily, and they are like that. There are some individual shooting stars are here in a dandelion, but the chocolate lilies are like that, and the buttercup. And we did not plant any of these. And then the wild iris bloom, and they are just through blooming now. And the wild iris are like that. So then we have some special guests that come out here to go uh, fishing. They don't come out to play golf, and some of them know how to catch them. And this fellow knows how to catch them. The unfortunate thing is that uh, the bears live here, which is not unfortunate, but they tear up the greens, and so there are many patches in the greens where we have artificial turf, and they are compliments of the bears. So then uh, in 2015, September issue of Golf Digest, there was a picture of our sixth green uh, and the backdrop for that. So Bubba was on the cover, but uh, we made that addition. So uh, that's kind of the story of what's going on here. And uh, that's what I have to say.